Welcome to Story Talk, a roundtable discussion of a single story at a time. I'm Matthew Schmidt, here with Adam Alsergani. Hi. And Ingrid Wensler. Hi. As well as Hera the Dog, Phantom the Cat, and Zoe the Bird, who may assert themselves at any moment. Today we'll be discussing The Heart of the Park by Flannery O'Connor. Originally published as a short story only when the complete stories appeared in 1971, The Heart of the Park is included as a chapter in O'Connor's novel, Wise Blood. Full disclosure, none of us have read Wise Blood. Instead of focusing on how this story operates as a story versus its inclusion as a chapter in the novel, we'll be focusing specifically on The Heart of the Park as a standalone piece as presented in the complete stories. In the story, Enoch Emery is a guard at the park, located at the center of a city. Each day after he gets off duty, he follows a routine of visiting a museum at the park's center, wherein lies an astonishing display. First, however, he must complete his ritual of going to the swimming pool, stopping off at the frosty bottle for a chocolate malted milkshake, and touring the zoo leading up to the park's museum. For some time, he's been wanting to show his discovery of the museum display to the right person. In Enoch's mind, the wonder is not fit for just anyone to behold. During the course of the afternoon, he finds a proper individual in Hazel Weaver, a shady character with a checkered history. So to begin, uh, I think of Enoch Emery as a looker. Uh, not a handsome man, but one for whom vis visualization is paramount to breathing. His guard duty involves watching. The swimming pool forays are downright predatory. He finds a clerk at the frosty bottle comely and daily views the animals in their cages. Emery's daily routine climaxes within the museum as he takes in an unusual and distant relic. What other forms of sight do you notice in the story? And how does that, the narrative employ vision at the sentence level? Hey, I'm going to let you go first, because I know you have a lot of thoughts, and particularly about voyeurism. <clears throat> um, and I want to step on your toes there. Um, well, thanks. Um, you know, I mean, I think this is a really wise starting place um, in that... Um, Enoch's a gate guard, and, I mean, he does spend much of his time, you know, covertly looking at, at women um, from the bush. Um, he has a vantage place within the park where he looks down at the pool and observes different women um, coming from the bathhouse or in the pool or sunbathing. Um, but he also is very drawn to the zoo and to the thing that he's going to take someone to at the end of the story. Um, so, I mean, I think central to the story, there, there is a tension between voyeurism and exhibitionism and how Enoch is relating to the two. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think likewise, uh, you know, to your question about the other forms that this takes, Matthew, um, I think crucially Enoch is someone who is drawn to things that he can't express in words. Um, and for him, for him looking is sometimes about, about that kind of feeling and about things that are, are beyond him. Um, he actually, he reminds me in a strange way because he's a totally different character of Bobby and Michael Cunningham's um, a home at the end of the world because Bobby um, is also a character who's who's differently wise um, and you know certainly in, intelligent in certain ways um, maybe a little less like superstitious and wise in the sort of like mystical sense um, but you know he's someone who's really dra drawn to sound and to music and that's how his character ends up articulating himself like he's not good at expressing himself in words and as a result you know the way in which he connects to music and what he has to say about music is how you can access his character and I mean I think Enoch operates very similarly for me in that um, 
you understand him through what he through what he sees. He he is very funny, and um, you know words aren't totally beyond him, but he can't express everything that's going on with him. And I mean, I think that that tension is there. Um, yes. I'll, I'll turn it to you, Adam. Before we jump okay. jump into Adam's uh, response, I just wonder since we kind of touched on it a little bit, uh, Ingrid. You do think Enoch is wise. Could you like ex- extrapolate that particular uh, assertion? Um, <laughs> well, actually, I, I have complicated feelings about this, and I, I wanted to bring it up um, and kind of discuss it with the two of you. I think, I think as a reader, I, I tend to be trusting of certain things that maybe I shouldn't be in the narrative. I mean, I think the narration positions Enoch as someone who has wise blood early on. Can I actually see the story so I can read the line? Um, So the first paragraph is, Enoch Emery knew when he woke up that day the person he could show it to was going to come. He knew by his blood. He had wise blood like his daddy. Um, So, you know, we don't get that from Enoch exactly. It's it's a little slippery in that it it feels like it could be omniscient and it could be his thought about himself. Um, I think there, there are moments where Enoch asserts judgment about things that are happening around him. For example, his friend Hayes Weaver, where I feel like intuitively he's getting something right. I don't want to get too far ahead of, and too far outside of this question's bounds, but I sometimes have the feeling that I, that I want to follow his judgment at least a little. Um, that said, I think especially when we get come to the conclusion of the story, I end up thinking a lot about Enoch's assertion that he feels like something is going to happen. We get that in a few different places, and the extent to which he he sort of wills his own fate, or the extent to which you know he's foreseen it. Um, but let's come back to that, maybe. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of. <laughs> There's a lot of separate things going on there. So I want to start with Matthew's question about uh, looking and visualization yeah, yeah. and go back to it. I think the voyeuristic aspect of this is unavoidable and yeah. maybe to tie that loosely into the ways in which Enoch is wise or isn't wise. Um, you know, Enoch is he's peeping toming, you know. Like, he's mm-hmm. publicly peeping toming, but he's peeping toming on women at the pool it's a pretty big aspect of this story and he's fascinated with um, women's bodies who the narrator is given to letting us know through Hayes and, and through her narration are maybe not conventionally attractive or if they are attractive come with certain kinds of other <laughs> irritations um, uh Irritations isn't the word I'm looking for, right? Like, personality-wise, they're they're difficult or dismissive or vain or, you know, like the one woman that Enoch goes and visits at the Frosty Bottle, the waitress, um, A, thinks he's a son of a bitch and wishes he would leave her the hell alone, and B, um, in typically Flannery O'Connor fashion, right, like, she wants you to know that Enoch, or the narrator, at least through Flannery O'Connor, wants you to know that he's sexually harassing this woman on a repeated basis despite her request that he go away. Mm -hmm. And also, like, she's drinking a mason jar full of whiskey every shift um, and is weirdly sort of like... um, you know, she thinks she has a certain kind of, like, insight that she doesn't have either, or that, like, um, at least when she comments on 
the cleanliness of Hayes, like, she doesn't have it in the way Hayes wants to be seen. And so I think there's a couple things going on. One is that, right, like, all of Enoch's activities are about seeing other things, right? Like, so he's a guard. He's literally someone who watches over the park, which he perceives to be the heart, this blood-pumping thing, um, at the center of a city, which he isn't wise in the sense that he's naive. He's come from somewhere else, but he prides himself on being young. He's only 18 and having a job already at the center of the city. Um, but then he's built this ritual about being at that center and sort of moving through the artery of the park by, you know, getting his own blood pumping, by voyeuristically, um, you know, peeping on women um, who have these, you know, slit um, swimming suits, which he thinks, like, at first they don't know, and then he realizes it's just the fashion of the time, and he's sort of shocked but pleased by the... Uh, you know, the general impropriety of the city and the looseness of things, and then he goes and he has to see the frosty bottle, he has to look at this woman who he has to confront in some way afterwards, then he goes and he has to look at the animals at the zoo, and he goes through every single cage at the zoo, and later he's going to instruct Hayes on what to look at and what not to look at in order to eventually get to the museum, where what you're doing is you know, in the kind of old school way of the museum, observing it, not interacting with it, right? And he's trying to garner this kind of knowledge, right? When he says the word museum, because it's got that kind of Greek V in place of a U, he <laughs> says he's <laughs> like a lunatic because he hasn't, like, figured out that you don't pronounce it as a V. Um, I think that, like, he's doing all of this looking... And there is a tension, I mean, wise is always a comparative term, right? Like, um, insofar as, like, it's either a comparison of yourself at some other time, like Enoch before he's at the city is probably less wise or more naive, but there's also the different kinds of wisdom within the context of the story, right? In the way that one... He's framing his own story. So whether or not something significant happens, totally up for debate. I And I'm interested in getting that out. I think I'm not only talking around it for those listening. Like The story is cryptic. You don't really know what the two men are going to see. Hayes doesn't know for most of the story what he has to go to see. He wants something from Enoch that Enoch won't give him until he's seen the thing because something's supposed to happen. Um, things do happen, but partly because Enoch is forcing the narrative through what he's doing by going through his visualization ritual of looking at the women, of leaving, of going to the frosty bottle to have a drink and like look at the other woman and flirt with her in his own interpretation. But he's always applying narratives to why he has to do that. It's almost like an OCD activity. Like, he's not... I had the same thought about it, actually. And, I mean, I think one thing that O'Connor does is so that's so smart is, you know, I mean, I think she's coming at that visualization from a lot of different angles thematically in terms of Enoch's profession. He's a gate guard for the park. Right. Um... But also, I mean, just in terms of how we end up accessing things in the story, we get to see things through Enoch. So um, as he's moving through the animals and taking his friend Hayes with, with him, um, I just wanted to read this part because I think it's a really good example of the kind of thing I'm thinking of. Enoch ran back to him and grabbed him by the arm, but Hayes pushed him off absently and kept on looking in the cage. It was empty. Enoch stared. It's empty, he shouted. What do you have to look at in that old empty cage for? You come on. He stood there sweating in purple. It's empty, he shouted. And then he saw it wasn't empty. Over in one corner on the floor of the cage, there was an eye. 
the eye was in the middle of something that looked like a piece of mop. <laughs> and the piece of mop was sitting on an old rag. He squinted close to the wire and saw that the piece of mop was an owl with one eye open. It was looking directly at Hazel Weaver. That ain't nothing but an old hoot owl, he moaned. You've seen them before. So, I mean, do you see how we get to see Enoch coming back to the cage, grabbing Hayes, but also we get to see exactly what he sees in that cage as he sees it. So we get the progression of it's empty, it's empty, which he's, you know, vocalizing, but then we get we get the piece of mop and the piece of mop that's sitting on the old rag before we get the owl. And I mean, this story is full of that kind of thing. And it's also full of very careful attention to where characters are and where things are. Yeah. Um, the lens of the story is really acted that way. And I think that it's also part of how if, if Enoch is wise in any way, shape or form, it is, it's out of that, that viewpoint and what he's creating and he always his lens is very very important to him and, mm -hmm. and how he experiences the thing is important to him in some ways I like envy that in people because I have a tendency to like be a, an intellectual ruiner of things by like overthinking about it too much <laughs> and analyzing it I don't and, know about that and I think that like you know, Matthew is is politely keeping his mouth shut on that subject. <laughs> but I, th I think that, like, right, like, he does have the ability to both... The owl isn't important to him and to move on past that instead of, like, having this obsessive staring contest that I presume Hayes is developing his own thinking about. But he also... Yeah, I mean, he's ignorant in the ways that he views the world, right? He thinks the woman at the frosty bottle has a secret crush on him, mm -hmm. even though she explicitly hates him explicitly <laughs> hates him. And, um, and I think that, like, but that it lets him live in a world that it, I don't live in anyway, um, where there's, there's a certain semblance of not dealing with guilt and being able to see the magic in things that are explicit, explicable <laughs> even because they have something written on a card that can explain what he's looking at. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think you've hit on some, both of you have hit on some important things um, in that, uh, in how the story unfolds. And, you know, you, you've touched a little bit on uh, the idea that Enoch really feels like this is where he's meant to be, right? Mm -hmm. He's in the city now, it's where he wants to be, but he's found like the place he's meant to be, the center of the city, the middle of the park. And, like, if we are to take, uh, you know, the park as the beating heart of the city, right? Like, he's guarding the entire city, right? And at the same time, his, his looking and voyeurism is, is to both understand better the heart of the city and what makes it beat. And, and that includes all of the people in it, um, but I also like feel like when he has this ritual of, you know, going through the park in a certain way, right? Like, it's almost like he gets in the bloodstream, you know, from a ventricle to a vein, right? Like, and he has to flow the way blood flows to get to the extremity that is the mystery at the heart of the city, the heart of the park. Yeah. And so, like, one of the um, things about that is, like, the placement of everything within the story, right? Like, I'm thinking about, like, I'm wondering what role you kind of think placement of action and things in the story takes. And how you feel action is driven by feeling. Um, for example, right, Enoch has stated he needs to share this with someone. It's going to be Hayes Weaver, right, as we know from the story. But he's really trying to, you know, alleviate the, quote, 
terrible knowledge like a big nerve growing inside him, end quote. Right? So, like, he feels he's, like, on this discovery, this understanding of sorts that not just anyone in the city knows. And, you know, I'm wondering what you think, you know, what is the knowledge that hinders Enoch in that particular way? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of things, right? Like, it's a story for me a lot about sort of atomism, right? Like, that there's this, this weird personification on Enoch's part about a lot of things and whatever wise blood is like I don't know that the story settles on I think the story wants to infer that Enoch has an idea of what wise blood is and then it somehow connects him to things he has this kind of prophetic quality about him in his own mind I think the story wants to infer or the narrator wants to infer that maybe Enoch actually doesn't have um, quite so much wise blood. And nevertheless, right, like a significant part of the story is that Hayes wants the address of some people. And we're following these two men while Enoch what he actually has, right? And what he's aware he has is something that Hayes wants. And so he's, he's guiding his own sort of semi-religious quest by holding this other man hostage who is maybe his friend. They know each other some way. In some way, Hayes knows that Enoch has acquired the address of someone and it's in some way important to him. And Enoch's need to get to whatever prophetic happening is going to go on. Whatever like happens at the top of the mountain for him goes beyond him caring. He speculates that maybe like Hayes has murdered somebody or, like, he's done something illegal that Hayes is kind of, like, weird intensity and kind of, like, staring off into space thing has something to do with the crime he's committed. Um, and he can't, he can't stop himself from doing the things he has to do, which also includes sort of weird religious ritual, the sort of, like, I think of it as, like, being a little bit of, like, speaking in tongues or something, not because I <coughs> think of that as, like, a metaphor so much as like whatever odd like religious derivation he has going on is a thing that's happening like one of my favorite moments in the thing and apparently Enoch part of his ritual every day when he goes through is he like says obscene things to all the monkeys and he's skipping some of that for the sake of this greater thing that's going to happen today but he does take this time <laughs> to stop at a cage where he says, quote, hyenas. He said, I ain't got no use for hyenas. He leaned closer and spit into the cage, hitting one of the wolves on the leg. It shuttled to one side, giving him a slanted, evil look. For a second, he forgot Hazel Weaver. Then he looked back quickly to make sure he was still there. But there's one, like, he doesn't have the knowledge that these aren't hyenas. He's, like, insulting them on the basis of what they are. Um, and he's interacting with them, and he believes that that's somehow significant to do in the way that, like, being superior to the monkeys and saying something obscene to them is something to do, and that's part of this pulsing thing that he's got to go through, and he actually is... I mean, I think he's probably learning something. It's not, like, great learning or significant learning, but, like, he's interacting with those animals every day. He is going to the museum every day, and he's studying and, and learning something, almost in the way that a, a painter or a naturalist would. He just has these weird applications that he's putting on to them and, like, reading into their behavior. Like, I don't think the wolf is 
responding to him calling it a hyena. I think I'm laughing at him about that. I don't think the wolf is giving him an evil slanted look, but he is looking irritated because somebody just spat on him. Um, or like he's moving away because something just came out of another animal's mouth and he's looking at it. I think he's like, I think what he actually doesn't know that he's putting sort of his wise blood in place for is what it is he's trying to learn in some kind of organized fashion and that is backed up or it's supported by the fact that the job he has he thinks of as being a big deal job um, and in the place that he should be so absent anything like direction he's self-directing toward learning something like that yeah so there were a few questions within that question um, I want to go back to place and placement for a moment so I mean I think I, I also noticed um, Enoch sort of flowing through the story in, the, in a bodily sort of way and that working as sort of a metaphor and you know I mean I think I think that movement also in fiction I think it's a, it's kind of it's a nice trick to play with ritual what usually happens and then what does because what ends up happening is the story sort of reaches outside of itself and you get a sense of what most days look like and how this one is exceptional but that ends up telling you more about a character than you'd learn otherwise because you have access to what the usual is and what the constant is yeah. so I mean that's that's a nice thing about this um, and I mean I think you, we really get to see like what this this ritual does for Enoch and that it is about kind of feeling his way into the thing but yeah. that there is this intense urge to share it and you know I mean I think I thought a lot about about that and reading this story and what that's about for him and you know I mean I think Matthew like your your word like alleviation or relief um, were ones I came to as well I think I also thought about that a lot in terms of seeing and the fact that I mean perhaps some of what Enoch wants is to see someone seeing what he sees <laughs> that was a boldy thing but then also I mean to think about the story in terms of like metafiction we're watching him see <laughs> and we're watching him sort of curate this experience for someone else as well um, so I mean I think that's something that I, I thought about in relation to sharing um, I also thought a lot about you know a couple moments that the story points us to in terms of knowledge and how how that knowledge and compulsion get talked about so one of the first instances um, is you know after he's been doing some 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 watching of women from the bushes um, he says, the park was the heart of the city. He had come to the city with a knowing in his blood. He'd established himself at the heart of it. Every day he looked at the heart of it, every day. And he was so stunned and awed and overwhelmed that just to think about it made him sweat. There was something in the center of the park that he had discovered. It was a mystery although it was right there in a glass case for everybody to see. And there was a typewritten card telling all about it right there. But there was something the card couldn't say, and what it couldn't say was inside him. A terrible knowledge without any words to it, a terrible knowledge like a big nerve growing inside him. He could not show the mystery to just anybody, but he had to show it to somebody. This person could not be from the city, but he didn't know why. He knew he would know him when he saw him, and he knew that he would have to see him soon or the nerve inside him would grow so big that he would be forced to rob a bank or jump on a woman or drive a stolen car into the side of a building. 
His blood all morning had been saying the person would come today. Um, so, I mean, I think the reason that Matthew and, and I come to words like alleviate is like, it's like he can't hold this knowledge in his body physically. It's grown too big and he would have to act out in some kind of criminal way yeah. if he couldn't relieve it. Um, and I mean, that's a lot tied to, to expression and this kind of intuitive feeling he has about mystery. I think some of what the story pushes me toward is, especially because of, you know, all this business about wise blood and knowing, like, what do we actually believe that Enoch knows, and, like, how much of this do we trust and buy into? Like, is this purely, you know, a ridiculous character who we're follow following around who's just, I mean, funny and a spectacle in his own way or is is he a little bit of both I mean I think sometimes I end up coming closer to what a story is by looking at like what it's not and I mean I think one thing I feel about Enoch is like he doesn't remind me of Kay in the castle um, he's not someone who's overwhelmed by his present and grasping in a way that's about higher powers keeping things from him and about misinformation and confusion around that right. um, he is definitely naive and um, not very well educated I mean to your point about the museum like there, there's experience and knowledge that he lacks um, I think for me, some of the story's mystery ends up being that I feel like most of what the story is doing is pointing, pointing me to reasons why I shouldn't trust him, why, why he's a little ridiculous, but there feels like there's a little room for something else. And I mean, in a way, that's the mystery that I end up pursuing as a reader. So, so yeah, like Adam is putting a religious lens on this yeah. story to like try to understand what you're talking about right now, Ingrid. And yeah. so I want to ask him specifically like how he's reading the religious aspects of this, like outside of like yeah, Henry yeah, O'Connor, yeah, obviously, yeah. but like, so one way I thought to think about it is if what Enoch is doing is guarding some sort of religious secret. Yeah. He has to do penance in some form. Right. Which is the guarding, to an extent. Mm -hmm. But once his duty is complete, he can, you know, sin by looking at women in the pool. But he never takes it farther than that. Instead, he goes to cool off at the Frosty Bottle. Yeah. But then, like, after he's taken a moment to collect himself, he then visits the caged, imprisoned animals, which is what any human being is in their own mind. Yeah. And <clears throat> finally, there is the final thing, which... I'm going to bring up now uh, because we're going to get to it eventually. Yeah. The final thing is a shrunken, mummified corpse yeah. in the museum. And, you know, because it's the pinnacle of the story, like, one can assume it is supposed to represent something if one so chooses. Yeah. Now, to go back to something Ingrid brought up in the, the reading that she just did Hazel Weaver is not from the city right and possibly the reason Hazel Weaver must be the person that Enoch Emery shows this is because Hazel Weaver is not a believer right sticking with this religious lens you know I think 
that can be a certain way to look at this. And so the question that it brings up for me then is Enoch wants to be certain that his belief is correct. Mm -hmm. And that religion, in fact, is accurate and there. And like everything that he understands as religion actually happened and is still happening. Now, I guess my question to you is like, you said earlier he was less knowledgeable before he came to the city, and now somehow is more knowledgeable. Yeah. Maybe you could explain, like, you know, how you arrive at that conclusion based on how you understand this religious perspective operating. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of things operating in the story and a lot of things operating in my mind <laughs> about this. I told you, I guess before we started, I, well, I am not looking at this as the novel Wise Blood a few years ago. Ingrid and I actually watched the, the John Huston film version of Wise Blood. Um, and so I've got some thinking around Hayes and, and who he is but also I think like there's something at least in a kind of teleological way that like there are um, that what Enoch understands his within the context of the story what Enoch as someone in a city somewhere in the American South is doing is he's interacting with a belief system that says some power in the universe or something about him internally as a consciousness in the universe um, has access through feeling within his blood which is notably in its descriptive terms sexualized um not only because the ritual involves him looking at women and pursuing women in a kind of like climax metaphor, but also like the weird description of the kind of nerve and that need to actualize pressure out of, and like release pressure out of growth. But he be Enoch believes that there's something, he can access the future in some way through that blood, that, that the nerviness in the blood tells him something and I think that's inherently right like it believes in some kind of consciousness connecting him to the rest of the world on that level and he's got to perform a ritual which is about empowerment which is about certain kinds of cleansing right within the context of the story one thing that we're going to get told by the woman at the frosty bottle is that like Enoch is a son of a bitch, but she thinks that Hayes is a good, clean boy. And Hayes, who, on whatever trip Hayes is on, uh, bugs out at this woman and just stares her down, blank-faced, and goes, I ain't clean. And, like... Yeah, so, so let's, let's take that. Like, yeah. Um, why... What do we learn about Hayes through his actions? Right, like, how does O'Connor shed light on his motivations? Yeah, well, Hayes is driving around in a shitty car. He's coming up to a guy who he has some kind of connection with, who he clearly does not like. In my mind, he clearly does not like this man. And he just, when he turns up, he just makes a demand about what he requires. Right, like... Here's the moment in the text. Well, Enoch said, I declare, if it ain't Hazel Weaver, how are you, Hazel? The guard said, I find you at the swimming pool, Hazel Weaver said. He said you hid in the bushes and watched the swimming. Enoch blushed. I always have admired swimming, he said. Then he stuck his head farther through the window. You were looking for me, he exclaimed. These people, those people, Hazel said, those people named Moats. 
Did she tell you where they lived? Enoch didn't seem to hear. You came out here special to see me, he said. As in Sabbath moments, she gave you the pillar. Did she tell you where they live? And then, you know, whatever's going on with Hazel, he, he's on a mission of his own. It involves these two moats people, right? Like, without reading outside the text, I think, too much, I think, like, moats is an interesting name, right? He's got to cross over something, right? Like, to get whatever he wants, but he also has to know where the place is that he's got to find. Um, and whatever the connection is between these two men, right? Like, Hazel knows that he, Enoch knows this woman and this man from she gave you the peeler right like she handed him something in the past so there are these like not only are these rituals of cleaning and cleansing that are like of import right Hayes doesn't say anything to the woman at the frosty bottle he just kind of listens to her drunkenly talk at him about what of a son of a bitch Enoch is until he loses his mind and then he doesn't want it to be defined as clean. But whatever he's doing, something, some kind of baton magically has been passed you know, back. I actually, um, I looked up Peeler and it's actually slang for a stripper. Um, so I, I think that's what we're talking about there. She gave Enoch a stripper? I mean, I, 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 yeah, I guess. I, mean, I think that's... I, I'm not sure that answers more my question. I, no, I mean, indeed, <laughs> like, I, I looked it up because I was like, peeler that, like, what, a vegetable peeler? Um, I, I felt confused about that, and I mean, I think, to me, stripper makes more sense in the context of the story, but, I mean, doesn't answer any questions um, further <laughs> about, about um, you know, what Hayes is actually up to. Yeah. Other than that, you know, I mean, he has a quest for this address... Right. And he also, it's important that other people understand he isn't clean. It's not clear to me that he wants to be clean. And he also, I think, significantly at the end, like, hits Enoch with a rock and knocks him unconscious onto a white painted tree. Like, I, I think, like, there's this whole process that they go through together, whatever happens... There is no real conclusion. Like, they don't come to the actualization. They don't come to the kind of actualization I would expect out of that because they're not exactly telling each other what it is they need to acquire or why. Well, they're telling each other what they have to do, but they're not telling each other what the kind of outcomes are. And I think that in that weird way, right, like, this isn't like a Christian salvation that they're working their way through. It's more like, a process of purification toward an abstract realization, at least from Enoch's end. I think from Hayes's end, it could be fucking anything. Um, he could go want to kill these people. He could go want to pick up a, a stripper slash peeler. I like I. Which this is a lot of effort though for him to go to yeah. to acquire any of those things, right? Something about all that has weird weight that like mimics a religious experience insofar as there's something significant to these two men. Different things are significant to those two men, but they're willing to go through these rituals in order to get there. Yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are so many things that are strange about Hazel Weaver, um, and he feels like the per perfect person, you know, for this story to bring along as the somebody to choose. Um, and I mean, I think... I, I paid a lot of attention to um, how Hazel gets described, um, and I mean repeatedly he's he's described as wooden, as his face is described as a face that might have been cut out of the side of a rock, um, as his, his face has no expression, um, but his eyes show something. Um, it's described as. And one moment as if he were looking at a piece of wood. Um, notably, like, he's always described 
in these sort of natural terms. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, I think ties to the park a little bit, but I mean, going back to the thing that I was talking about, about, you know, Enoch needing to show someone what he's seen. In a way, Weaver feels like the perfect person because he's someone who doesn't react consistently. Um, right. In fact, like the owl moment is the first moment where, you know, he sort of seeks something out and yeah. reacts to it. There are moments where he gets wound up in response to something. Um, the I ain't clean is that moment. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think my read on that is that um, it doesn't feel like it's about shame so much as it's about insistence. Yeah. Well, um, it's also about, about something that is integral to his identity and that he doesn't want misunderstood. And per that quote that you read earlier, I think that Hayes doesn't want to be misunderstood about what's essentially a metaphor to be clean, right? Like, there's nothing in those descriptions of Hayes that says the man doesn't take a shower or that, like, that's what he's referring to, but also <laughs> right. that, like, that whatever Enoch needs Hayes to see is something that he needs him to see despite the fact that it's in a public museum with a little card there explaining what it's doing. So what he needs Enoch to see and what he needs Enoch to realize with him is something that goes beyond the basic facts of the fact that anyone could go look at any of these things at any time um, which is I think drives into the very peculiar way that Enoch looks at everything right like he could just go to the swimming pool at the park after work and like he could interact with these women <laughs> or meet them like, but he, that's not what the ritual is. Yeah, no, I mean, there's a very interesting line about that early on. Um, I'll, I'll read just a few. Um, he saw three women all with their suits split, the pool full of people, and nobody paying them any mind. That was how the city was, always surprising him. He visited a whore every time he had two dollars to spare, but he was continually being shocked by the looseness he saw in the open. He crawled into the bushes out of a sense of propriety. Yeah, which is insane! <laughs> <clears throat> um, I mean, it certainly gets me thinking about how, he, how he's relating to the things that he's seeing. Um, <laughs> great, insane. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's an unusual attitude. Like, he's... He feels he should be hiding. Right. He doesn't feel like the world should be more buttoned up or more proper. Um, in fact, like, he's kind of taking himself out of the scene. And, I mean, he says something similarly about, um, like, the monkey's ass. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, like, in terms of, like, exhibition, like, he seems to want to say, like, I don't want to be an exhibitionist myself. Like, if I had an ass like that, I would sit on it. Right. Um, like, a very proper guy in his way. But the looseness, of course, is, right? like, <laughs> it's the monkeys on display and displaying it. The women are on display. But the, like, wherever Enoch's propriety comes from, it comes from not the city, and it may be coming from his, his quote-unquote wise blood wherever he gets that notion but we know he gets that notion at least from his father who's absent from the story mm -hmm. as a body yeah all right so the story starts on the blood right the yeah. wise blood if this and that's a fallacy yeah i would i mean it so. just is yeah blood can't be wise yeah i would agree <laughs> so <laughs> what <laughs> What are we to make, then, of your religious reading? Because, no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious here. Like, can, can we put a reading, a religious reading, a, a humorous reading? Uh, yeah. Right, like, as, as we've discussed, right, like, there's, 
there's a denouement and you know they they see the the shrunken mummy yeah and talk about you know how old it was and where it come from you know like it, it had to be shipped here and then encased and like you know if the mystery is within this petrified body but the mystery is built on a fallacy what do we learn and how do we get there um I mean I I, I should specify that like yes O'Connor has a lot of fun in this story and like I'm kind of coming at this through humor. Yeah. Oh, it's clearly a comic story. So, so like, you know, that that is definitely part of this. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I would agree. I, th- I think it's deeply funny. Um, you know, I mean, one thing I wanted to say about um, Hazel that I didn't get a chance to say is, I mean, I think one thing that's really funny is that, you know, he wants this address. He states that he's kind of... You know, this stone-faced, wooden-faced man who, I, you know, I assume is, is probably a criminal of some time, kind or who doesn't have very good intentions based on his own insistence on saying, I ain't clean, like I read that. Well, he's like as, a wise guy. As a wise yeah. guy, I'm um, sure. And, I mean, I, I get some of that from Enoch, so it's, you know, I'm not sure Enoch at one point claims that he he senses that the car is stolen. He senses particular things. Like, I, I, I don't know about that, but I, I get the feeling that Hazel is, is a criminal based on, on what I get from him in the story. That said, it's strange that he goes along with Enoch as far as he does. Um, at one point, he says... He questions whether he knows the address, but I mean, this is after he's already been to the Frosty Bottle and, you know, I mean, on some of Enoch's plan stops. And <laughs> Enoch just says to him, it begins with a two, and then he keeps going. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I, there, there are so many moments along those lines. I think for, I think for me, it's important to say about religion that the story isn't specifically religious. Um, it's not pointing us to a particular sect or specific belief um, other than these intuitive feelings that Enoch has. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think if there is illusion um, about about those beliefs um, thinking just about the beliefs not about naming and things along those lines you know there's there's something kind of primal about about the way these feelings get talked about because you know they're in the blood they're about blood beating that kind of thing yeah. um, that said you know I mean I think I ended up thinking a little bit about like and Nietzsche's assertion that God is dead and what <laughs> what where that ends up leaving people in in a story that is so funny that's not seriously asking those questions um, that said I mean I do think Enoch seems to be someone who in his in his looking is looking also for meaning. I, I see him as searching for something. And the funny thing about this story ends up being his naivete and like the ways in which the his his particular attack doesn't quite make sense and doesn't map to usual religious experience. Um, that said, I mean, for me, like, you know, you two started with, like, thinking about the fallacy of wisdom in the blood. Um, I think, 
I think there's something about the leaving room for a little bit of a religious experience, even amidst all this strangeness, that that makes that makes this story for me ask questions not so much about what happened and how right Enoch is, but about about belief. Like it's a story for me about about that, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I mean, like the weird places that ecstasy can come from, the weird ways in which we frame religion, like questions about religion and belief and what there is in the world and spirituality and how we interact with it and how funny and strange and misguided it can be. But also, it, it doesn't feel like it offers definitive answers or rules anything out in particular so much as it's it's laughing, it's questioning, it's laughing, it's questioning, it's ecstatic, and maybe we like feel a little something along the way. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that makes sense. I think it does make sense. I think that you're right that it doesn't exclude, say, right. It's not a story that says like there is no God or there's no <laughs> way to have a religious experience that would be in some ways valid or meaningful or that we could even witness on the page or that would be, you know, um, foundational for a group of people. But, like, in the the kind of, you know, Nietzschean God is dead sort of way, the, the thing that you lose when you don't trust organized religion or when you don't trust in in sort of like a guiding power is a belief that things are happening for a reason and the things that actually happen here are like in whatever the length of time these people are alive they have wasted a day doing (laughs) like an 18 year old boy's compulsive ritual (laughs) um, in order for the 18 year old boy to believe that something significant has happened by him showing someone else something that individual could have just seen and had whatever experience he wanted with but also saw it in a way that was just aggravating to him and it just leads to Enoch getting knocked unconscious and Hazel not getting what he wants um while meanwhile, uh, they've, you know, Enoch has violated this woman who's walking around with her two kids and harassed this waitress and, you know, directly or indirectly been rude and upset the animals at the zoo. <laughs> um, that, like, it comes to sort of no consequence, and, and we see that in part because that religious ritual is explicitly insane like in a way that like if you describe any religious ritual it sounds explicitly insane um if you put it kind of frankly and you talk about the repetition of like i go to church every sunday and i drink the blood of somebody who died two thousand years ago right like it's it sounds explicitly insane um which isn't to dismiss, like, anybody who takes communion. It's just to say that, like, the story is laying it out in such a way as to point out, I think the wise blood puts us in a position to, like, look at it through a religious lens. Religious in the general sense of, like, I'm using some kind of, like, sense of order and magic and higher power in order to actualize meaning in my world and like what's funny about that is because we see someone making it up in front of us via the things he doesn't know right he's claiming wisdom not through the sort of things he could learn about the city by just engaging with the city directly but by like standing outside the city and claiming to that wise blood he's going through this like compulsive ritual over and over and over again in order to make himself feel secure and significant and like it ends up hurting him he doesn't exactly get what he wants 
And I don't know that I want <laughs> to get these people's <laughs> address at all. Um, but yeah. he certainly isn't helpful to Hazel. And he's definitely not helpful to anybody else. Um, and, I mean, he, like, he doesn't even... Even in his ritualizing, right, one of the first things we see Enoch do is he, like, he shits on the other guard for being 15 minutes late. Now, that is rude if the guard really is 15 minutes late, but he says to that guard that he wastes 15 good minutes every day waiting for this guy. <laughs> and his 15 minutes wasted isn't doing the exact same thing, which is for as long as he wants being a pervert in the bushes, sexually harassing waitress, going to see the same animals who he talks shit to, and then going to walk through a museum where the guard also hates him. And he knows that about the guard. To see the same mummy who he hasn't taken the time to learn about in any significant way. And so, I mean, I think the story is laughing at a certain kind of religious ritual that also refuses to engage the realities of the world, including the ongoing world. And I, I think there's something there about that. And therein lies the humor, right? But like, if you're looking at it outside the story, that humor is reflexively also looking at, you know, uh, a version of the South that's pretty preoccupied with religion. Well, there you have it, folks. A comforting, <laughs> uncomfortable story. <laughs> the best kind of story, in my opinion. Um, I, I pushed a little harder on this one because, you know, I, I agree there are no, like, hard and fast answers. Um, but that it does allow us an opportunity to consider some of these larger ideas that humans have, both in how they think about the world and how they act in the world. And, you know, some of the comfort can come from, you know, doing the same thing over and over. Um, and some of the uncomfortableness can come in realizing that what we're doing over and over is not always the best thing to be doing. <laughs> or even close in Enoch Emery's case. <laughs> However, right, like, it, it, it brings up maybe the biggest human question of, like, you know, what should I be doing? What am I doing? Why am I here? Thank you for joining me, friends. Thank you. Thank you.